Well, I'm a physicist. However, I realize that there are two great mysteries that are unsolved in the universe, from outer space and inner space. From outer space, it's the Big Bang, the creation of the universe. We want to know what banged, why it banged, and what happened before the Big Bang. That's what I do for a living. That's my day job. However, there's another mystery of inner space. What lurks inside the brain? You realize that throughout human history, people have theorized about it, but it was impossible to record the inner workings of the brain until now. Because of physics, we can now see thoughts moving right inside the brain, ricocheting like a ping pong ball. We can record thoughts. Things like telepathy, that is mind reading, telekinesis, moving objects with the mind, recording memories, uh, uploading memories. This was once considered science fiction until now. Because of physics, we can do all of the above. We can now attach the brain to machines where we can now have the power that was usually reserved to, to wizards and sorcerers. We can now move objects with the mind, record memories, upload memories, and it's all because of physics. In the last 10 years, we've learned more about the brain than in all of human history combined. Right, we're in a situation where we look at previous theories of the brain and we realize the brain was a black box. But you see, radio can go right through the brain effortlessly. Radio does that even as we speak. So why not use the power of electromagnetism to record the blood flows of the brain? And that's where physics comes in. Physics allows us to trace the movement of blood in the brain, which in turn follows the movement of electricity and electrical activity in the brain. For example, we know that to build a computer that will simulate the brain, that computer would have to be the size of a city block. One solid city block of computers it would have to be cooled by a river and energized by a nuclear power plant. And yet your brain does it with 20 watts of power. So when someone calls you a dim bulb, that's a compliment. Your brain with 20 watts can do more than a city block worth of computers driven by a nuclear power plant. Well, 10, 20 years from now when you walk into a room, you will assume that chips cost a penny, that the word computer has disappeared from the English language. You will assume that there's computers everywhere and nowhere, and you will communicate with them in the cloud mentally. You will mentally simply turn on the lights, set the thermostat, turn on the TV set, and surf the web. And if you want to type something, you'll think, and documents will be typed. You'll call for your car, tell your car where to go, and the car will drive itself. So you will do this effortlessly simply by the power of the mind. Telekinesis, the power to move objects with the mind, that's going to be our power. Already, we can hook up the brain to a laptop which controls a mechanical arm and a mechanical leg, giving us an exoskeleton. In fact, my colleague Stephen Hawking, who is totally paralyzed, he's now lost control of his fingers, we've now put a chip in his right glass. Next time you see him on television, look at his right glass. There's a chip connected to a laptop computer, and that's how Stephen communicates with the world. And so this means that exoskeletons could become commonplace in the future. And we might also have surrogates. That is, the brain connected to a computer controlling the avatar or the surrogate. That could be the future of the space program. It costs a lot of money to put humans in outer space. Why not put robots on the moon that are mentally controlled by an astronaut sitting in his hot tub, sitting in his living room? And so this could revolutionize emergency workers. It could revolutionize the space program. Well, it used to be that we thought that we would have robots very soon, robot maids and butlers. Boy, were we wrong. We now realize that the brain is very sophisticated. It's 100 billion neurons, as many stars as there are in the Milky Way galaxy. Each neuron connected to 10,000 other neurons. So the number of connections is 10,000 times 100 billion. 
That is an unimaginably large number of connections in our mind. So our most advanced robots have the intelligence of a cockroach, a retarded cockroach, a lobotomized, stupid, retarded cockroach. That's our most advanced robot. But it's only a matter of time before they become as intelligent as a mouse, then a rabbit, then a cat or a dog, and finally maybe a monkey. Who knows when? I think maybe perhaps late in this century we'll have robots as smart as a monkey. At that point, we should put a chip in their brain to shut them off if they have murderous thoughts because potentially they could become dangerous. Because after all, if they're super smart, they may put us in zoos and throw penis at us and make us dance behind bars. So I think there should be safeguards like putting chips in their brain to shut them off. Now, the question is, can robots become smarter than us? And the answer is, well, yeah, why not? However, it's not going to happen anytime soon. And we're going to have decades and decades to prepare for that. And so I think that statements that they're going to be robots very soon are perhaps too optimistic. But eventually, it's going to happen. And when that moment happens, I think we should merge with them. We have in some sense been merging with technology for thousands of years. When you look at ancient civilizations, they had tattoos, they had makeup, they had all sorts of ways of trying to alter their physical bodies. Now we have cochlear implants, the gift of hearing. People have the option of putting cochlear implants which will allow them to hear sounds. In the, in the short term, we're talking about the artificial retina. The artificial retina already exists. It's not super sophisticated yet. Uh, you can see basically uh, many, many pixels that a substitute for an eye that doesn't function. But an artificial retina is coming. Exoskeletons, we have them already. Uh, mechanical arms, mechanical legs, controlled by thought alone. That already exists. In fact, we can even do this on the internet. We've actually placed uh, monkeys in the United States controlling a robot in Japan via the internet. That's today, exoskeletons. So in the future, we're going to have surrogates. That is the ability to have superpowers controlled mentally. That'll be perhaps the future of emergency workers and the future of the space program, avatars with superpowers. In the far term, we have to realize that if robots become more, uh, more sophisticated, more intelligent, there is a chance that they could become very, very superior to us, in which case we should think about merging with them. Now this, of course, will be done democratically. People will choose if they want to merge with robots. This is not going to be forced on people. Now it sounds unpleasant to some people because they have this vision of having implants dangling from their head, looking like some uh, monster robot from a science fiction movie. They realize that these so-called implants could be microscopic. They, with nanotechnology, we may be able to enhance the power of the mind and the brain in a way that is basically invisible. You wouldn't be able to tell if a person has been enhanced this way or not. Well, the holy grail of nanotechnology is the replicator. That is, you simply ask for something and the device changes whatever you put into it into what you want. This is straight out of Star Trek. Now, some people said that, well, the key to a replicator is a nanobot. That is a microscopic robot that you can't even see that cuts atoms apart, that cuts molecules, rearranges molecules. So you take a glass and you change it into a dish and you take a bunch of dishes and you turn it into a table. That's the power of a magician. Now, is that even physically possible? Some people said it's too much. It's asking too much of a nanobot. But you see, nanobots already exist in one form. Mother Nature has already created a nanobot. Mother Nature can take a bunch of hamburgers and french fries and turn it into a baby in nine months. That is amazing. How do you do that? How does Mother Nature turn hamburgers into a baby in nine months? By ribosomes, which cut apart DNA 
and protein molecules at precise points and rearrange them. That is a miracle. A molecule, a molecule that takes apart hamburgers one by one and creates a baby in nine months. So it is possible, though of course to re-engineer it would take a technology far beyond anything that we have at the present time. Now, some people think that a nanobot is gonna look like something right out of a construction site. It's gonna have tongs, it's gonna have a welding thing, it's gonna have clippers, and it's gonna look like something that you would imagine from a Lego set. Well, there are criticisms of that because at the atomic scale, quantum effects start to come into play. And quantum mechanics says that there's uncertainty. You don't really know precisely the location of an atom. And so this object that we visualize in our mind, a nanobot with clippers and with blow torches and with the ability to cut molecules at a precise point, that's not possible. We have something called the Casimir effect. Quantum effects that as you get close to molecules, they are repelled and they come toward you. So this is the sticky fat fingers problem. That if you have a nanobot with clippers cutting DNA at certain points, the hands are actually rather sticky because of the Casimir effect. And they are like, uh, like gloves. They're not very precise. Now, I believe that it is possible, but it's a technology that is still far more advanced than what we have at the present time. Mother Nature does it, but look, Mother Nature has had three and a half billion years to play with things like nanobots. We've only done this for a few decades. So, you know, give us a break. It's gonna take time. So don't expect replicators anytime soon. I think they are probably possible within the laws of physics, but it'll take many long decades before we can create a nanobot. Well, first we have to understand the past. Take a look at civilization hundreds of years ago. Uh, back in the 1700s, what was long distance communication in the 1700s? Long distance, a long distance communication was yelling out the window. That's how people communicated, by yelling at each other. What was high speed travel in the 1700s? Getting stuck in the mud with a wagon, if you could even afford a wagon. But what happened? We physicists worked out something called thermodynamics. We could calculate how much energy you can extract from a lump of coal. And that created the Industrial Revolution. Steam engines allowed us to create locomotives, which allowed us to replace human labor and sail across continents in a matter of days. This was unimaginable during feudal times. So in the 1800s, we had the Steam Revolution, the Industrial Revolution. In the 1900s, we physicists began to harness electricity and magnetism. That electrified whole continents, giving us the electric age. And then in the last 50 years, we physicists worked out transistors and lasers, giving us high technology, the space program, iPods, iPads, telecommunications, the internet, GPS, all of that coming from quantum physics. So we've had three waves of innovation, steam power, electricity and magnetism, and high technology. Now, what is the fourth wave? This is the big question. What will dominate the rest of the 21st century? I think it's gonna be a combination of molecular physics, that is nanotechnology, that is the physics of molecules used in manufacturing at the molecular level, biotechnology, where we have quantum mechanics govern the motions of DNA, which controls life, and then artificial intelligence, because now we're reducing the circuitry of the brain down to neurons. And so I think these three molecular technologies will propel us into the future.